Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. We give you praise for all that will happen in this upcoming year. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Today is a day that I've been looking forward to for a year, over a year. The Lord began to deal with me on some issues where the grace of God is concerned and just really has solidified some things in, in my understanding. And uh, most of all of this year, it's going to require us to really be taught and trained in the Word. We don't have time to have fun and games at church. We got to get ready. There's serious times ahead of us, and there are certain things we need to know and we need to have an understanding of. And so, today I'm going to begin a series entitled, Understanding the Trials of Your Faith. Understanding the Trials of Your Faith. And many of us understand that there are a lot of things that happen in life, <laughs> and even more so today in the midst of pandemic and the normal stuff that happens. And yet, sometimes there's a the question, why is this happening? Um, sometimes there's a the question, is it, is it God's will for me to suffer? Is it God's will for me to go through these trials? Is it God's will for me to go through the things that we go through? I think sometimes we're misled into thinking that as Christian people, that means we have no more trouble, no more trials, that's it because I'm saved. I can't tell you how wrong that is. Because as Christian people, we must mature. And we've got to understand God's Word because Satan is trying to play a trick. He's, he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's the accuser of the brethren. And the battle is going to be fought right up here. And, and the Bible says my people are destroyed because of their ignorance, because of what they don't know and what they don't understand. When I first teaching, started teaching the gospel of grace, I lost a lot of friends. I became this heretic and all these other kind of things, but everything I had gone through was to prepare me just for all of that. And boy, if they had a problem with me then, oh dear God, they might as well take my name and put mud on it now because I am completely and totally free of the fear of people. And I'm ready to teach this. And I'm ready to share this with you. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the trials of our faith. But the first thing I want to deal with is, is, is our faith. And this is going to go against and contradict a lot of things. And I'm not up here trying to say that, you know, this person was wrong or that person was wrong. I believe everybody taught what God told them to teach for that time and for that season. But there's a new season right now. There's a season that's going on that, that churches have never dealt with before. Don't know what to say, don't know how to, how to do it. So you're going to have to come out of your religion. Religion and self are closely related. And there are a lot of things you have heard religiously that I'm asking you to rethink these things as we go through the Word. Don't fight it because I've already gone through it. Don't fight it. Just listen to it. Check it out. And if you're born again with the Holy Spirit, He will bear witness in your spirit. Now, if you're just selfish and religious, then you'll try to protect your religion, and then that'll create another problem. And so today is the first day of what I will call a can of whoop open on the devil. Amen? <laughs> We're going to tear that tail up. We understand what I'm saying? We're going to eat his lunch. Amen? Now, let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, let's, let's start off with this, the faith issue. Let's, because we're talking about the trials of our faith, and for most of us, 
we have been trained, not that anything's wrong with it, but maybe there is some things I want to look at. We have trained, we've been trained to have faith in our faith. Does everybody understand that when, when I say, in other words, you have faith in all of the faith principles that you operate and you're, you're looking and depending on, on you. You're looking and depending on your performance in faith to bring you victory. But how many of you have ever ventured out in faith and ended up a little disappointed because you didn't see the manifestation of your faith? Can I get a witness? I have many times. You know, where, whether it was sickness and I was having faith and that didn't happen or whether it was finances and, and I was believing for that, did all thing, that didn't happen. I, I remember one time, I, and my, you know, I, I, my aunt, she's gone home to be with the Lord, but, you know, I, I remember releasing my faith. I remember using oil. I remember going on a fast. I remember putting on, on, on the Jewish, uh, uh, what's that, cloth? Yeah, and, and I did everything I knew to do, and she, she died. And, and I'm like, you know, but, but my faith was, my faith was, have you ever been that? My faith was this, what happened? And then there, there are lots of Christians who have, you know, they're not, they're not uh, Christians anymore because of that, the failure of their faith, okay? And so I, I'm thinking, Lord, maybe I'm missing something here. This, I have faith in my faith, and, and I'm thinking, well, you know, there's something not, not there, faith in my faith. And I heard that, I was trained in that, and then sometimes I would, you know, do the principles and have faith in my faith, and then I, and I see some results. And then sometimes I didn't. And then I guess when God was trying to get my attention, there was a stream of uh, uh, times that I did it, and just nothing happened. But I never did think about leaving him, but I'm thinking something's not right. Something's, I'm missing something here, and I need to know this, okay? And then the first time I, I taught it, publicly in front of 12,000 people, I was rebuked publicly for it. And I thought, well, I didn't say nothing wrong. I mean, they just didn't understand it because I, I just knew that was the right thing. And I put it on the bench there for a moment and put it on the sideline for a moment and just simmered in it and worked out some more details on the inside. And here we are today. Are you ready? <laughs> so now here's where we start. I go to Hebrews chapter 11, 4. And I look at all these people that did things by faith. Verse 4, he says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he uh, being dead speaketh. So that was his faith. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see, see death. That was his faith. Verse 6, uh, but without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seven, by faith Noah did what he did, being warmed of God, uh, things not seen as yet move uh, with fear. You can read all that. And next one, he says, by faith Abraham, when he was called to, to go out into the place, which, let's go to the next one. He says, by faith, he sojourned there, Abraham, to, into a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs. And come, come on, and, 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 and through faith also Sarah herself re received strength to conceive seed. Her faith. Go to the next one. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Go to the next one. But now, now notice, all of, the, all, of the, all of the people you see in Hebrews chapter 11 were Old Testament saints. Every last one of them were Old Testament saints. And one thing about Old Testament saints, they live by their faith. Amen? And by their faith, they did some great things. So you don't see me coming down on it. By their faith, they did some awesome things. But look at what he said at the end of showing us all the Old, old, old Testament, all, all the Old Covenant prophets. Look what he said at the end. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They, saw, they got a lot of good things to happen, but they didn't receive the promise. God having provided some better things for us, New Testament saints, that they without us should not be complete. 
So even though they got a good report with their faith and having faith in their faith, he said God's got something better, better for us. Now I'm going to tell you right now, the faith of New Testament people should be different than the faith of Old Testament people. So I said, what are you talking about? Okay. You remember me years ago going through these four scriptures when I taught on faith? Habakkuk 2, 4, Romans 1, 17, Galatians chapter 3 and 11, Hebrews 10, 38. All right, now let's do it again with that in mind I just shared with you. So go to Habakkuk chapter 2 and 4. Habakkuk 2 and 4. There's a three-letter word I never could uh, work out. And so I just kind of did something with it, but I never could work it out. Look at this. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. Now, this is talking about Old Testament people. But the just shall live by his faith. You remember, you remember, you remember Bishop, we, we would go around talking about the just is going to live by his faith or we said it was God's faith. No, 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 no. It's making it very clear in the Old Testament, you just saw the heroes in the Old Testament, they were living by their faith and they got great report. There's some things that happened when they were living by their faith. But God said that we were going to have something better than our faith. Y'all follow me? He said that they are not a right in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Every person in the Old Testament that believed in God lived by their faith. His faith. His faith. Now, I don't see it anymore in the New Testament. Romans 1, 17, let's look at it real quick. Romans 1, 17. Now, please understand me, I am not by any means saying that when a person lived by their faith that things didn't happen. But even in the Old Testament, you see these guys living by their faith and they still went through hell, some of them. Yeah, they got a, they got a good faith report after they came out the fiery furnace, after they left the lion's den, after the flood. Now watch this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Go to Galatians chapter, was it, 3 and 11? But that no man is justified or declared righteous by the law in the, spirit of, uh, in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews chapter 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, if I had enough time, I would dissect those three scriptures and they would all be grace-based situations. Righteousness is a grace-based situation by faith. This situation here about not drawing back, that's a grace-based situation. Now, let me, let me take you where I'm talking about. Galatians 2 and 20, go there. All right, so what's the better? Instead of what's better than living by your faith. Because if you're living by your faith, you're, you're, you're depending on you. You got to depend on you. If you're living by your faith, your faith and the faith of those heroes of faith, and they, they depended on them. And there's nothing wrong with that unless something better comes. I'm not dogging out the old, I'm just saying why stay in the old when something better has come? Why use the, the, the telephone at home with the long cord, you remember that? Trying to walk around when you got a cell phone. The better has come. Now if you want to stay, and the Bible tells you, you want to stay stuck back there, you can, but if the better ha has come, come down, you're not supposed to be screaming, come down. When the better has come, just go towards the better. And look what he says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
and the life which I now live, I now live this life, the now that I now live, the life I now live in the flesh, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The just shall live by the faith of the Son of God. I no longer have to live by my faith. I can live by the faith of the Son of God. So that means when Jesus says, see, see, what is the faith of the Son of God? I, I need to break that down. The faith of the Son of God is all, all that has been made available, all of the finished works of Jesus Christ that has been made available to us by his faith. In other words, he did it. My faith is not responsible for the righteousness of God being available. My faith is not responsible for healing being available. My faith is not responsible for any of the finished works being available. Those things are not available because of my faith. Those things are all available because of the faith of the Son of God. And so for me to have faith that I'm the righteousness of God, when I'm not doing right, I'm not, I'm not righteous because of my faith. I'm righteous because of the faith of the Son of God. So now I put my faith in the faith of the Son of God. My faith is in, in what Jesus has done. In other words, even when I say I don't believe I'm righteous, you have to now contend with this. Jesus believes you're righteous. So even if you don't believe you're righteous, believe what Jesus believes. So what do you have to do to have faith? All you got to do to have faith is to be born again and invite Jesus in. And now Jesus lives in you, praise God. So you have faith right now. You have faith right now. That's why I won't tell you, don't come down here if you don't have faith. What I'll tell you is, don't come down here if you don't have faith in what Jesus has already done. Jesus has already healed you. So don't come down here begging and, and believing God that your faith can get you healed. Because I found out that my faith is lacking in a whole lot of ways but his faith has already manifested the stuff so rather than me trying to make something happen with my faith Jesus has already made it happen with his faith so I'm gonna have faith in his faith and I live now in this flesh by the faith of the Son of God So when we talk about faith for New Testament Christians, here's what I'm talking about. You're sick. Well, I have faith I'm going to be healed. I hear what you're saying. But with precision, you're sick. Well, I have faith in the faith of the Son of God who has made healing available for me. Therefore, my faith is in what's already finished. My faith is not in me doing these set of things to make this happen. I believe because Jesus believed it and what he believed has already happened. So my faith is by the Son of God. We live by the faith of the Son of God. I am living by the faith of the Son of God. What, what position now are you in when you now live by the faith of the Son of God? Watch this. Where do you find yourself when you now live by the faith of what Jesus has done? You find yourself in, watch this, rest. You rest. You rest. Why do you rest? Because you know that this thing being manifested is not necessarily on you. It is on Jesus. And so if Jesus believed you're righteous, I believe I'm righteous. And so I, I, I enter into rest. I, I, I can rest now because Jesus has made me righteous. And I believe what Jesus believes. Glory be to God. And instead of me putting all the pressure on me, when my faith has got to get this to happen, I say to myself, Jesus' faith has already made it happen. And so now I have have faith that I can receive what he has already manifested by his faith. Somebody says, you've been a little picky. Not necessarily. Do you know the things that have happened in our lives when we put all of it on our shoulders? You put it all on your shoulders. I'm the righteousness of God. And now what happens? Now through your works, you're trying to get something that's already been gotten. Oh, God, I need to be healed. And so on your faith, you're doing everything you can so you can get healed instead of having faith that Jesus has already made healing available. It even messes up your prayer life. You pray for two hours, I'm done in 10 minutes. 
Because you're doing all, you, you're saying all the scriptures, you're making all the confessions, you're doing everything the Bible meant for Old Testament Christians to do without having faith in Jesus Christ to try to make it happen. And I go before God and say, Father, I believe you believe that I'm healed. <laughs> Therefore, I believe you. And because you believe I'm healed, and I believe what you believe, then I now rest that I'm healed. All of a sudden, you can't do nothing in this life without depending on Jesus. And that's what he wanted. The difference is faith that depends on you and your effort and faith that depends on him. And we now have the better. We now live, we live, we live by the faith, we live by the faith of Jesus Christ. All right, go, go back to that. that uh, let's read it in the message, this, this thing in the message, verse 19 through 21 in the message. What actually took place is this. And this is what it reads in the message. <laughs> I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be, a, be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. All right, so first thing first, I have faith in the faith of Jesus. When you have faith in the faith of Jesus, you have now entered into rest. And rest is the highest kind of faith. There is no degree of faith that is ever going to be greater in your life when you find that you have ceased from your labors, ceased from your performance, and you are now resting in what Jesus has finished. Something happens when you go home and you say, I'm hungry, I gotta eat, I only have 15 minutes. And you find out, your wife says, I prepared that meal this morning, it's all ready. You rest, cause it's finished work, it's done. That's what God's calling you to do. I can tell when you are operating in your faith versus the faith of Jesus Christ. All I got to do is see the stress on your face and I'll say, you don't believe what Jesus believes, do you? Because if you believe what Jesus believed, you would enter into rest. If you believe that Jesus protects you and he loves you and he's healed you, and if you believe what Jesus believes, you would be resting. And that's going on right now. People are saying they have faith and they do. They have faith in their faith. I don't want you to have faith in your faith. Here's the problem. You having faith in your faith almost declares your independence from God. I got faith in my faith. Well, I have faith in the faith of Jesus. That means I am totally dependent on him. The entire message of grace I'll teach this year is going to be based on these one or two things your declaration of independence from God versus your dependence on God. That's what it all comes down to. Satan declared his independence from God by, by two words, I will. <laughs> and when he did that, he deceived a third of the angels, and now his job is to try to, 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 to trick everybody on the planet 
Don't depend on God. You can be independent. Don't depend on God. You rich. Don't depend on God. You got an education. Don't depend on God. You got good friends. Don't depend on God. You know how to pray for two hours. Satan's objective, the bottom line objective, is to get you to declare your independence from God. God's bottom line objective is to get you to a place where you declare your dependence on God. That's going to require for the goal to be put in the fire. Because you don't think for somehow you have, some of you have declared independence from God and don't even know it. But when there's yourself still involved, you need to stay in the fire a little longer. Because you still think you can do something without God. You're not ready yet. Because you keep referring back to what you can do. You're not ready yet. And now your faith has got to be put on trial so that God can perfect it for what he's trying to use you to do. But he can't use you to do nothing because too much of yourself is involved. Too much confidence in self is involved. And he needs to get you like he got Jesus. He's like, listen, Jesus says, I do nothing except the Father is with me. And Jesus is, is, is declaring all the time, I can't do nothing unless the Father. Jesus declared totally dependent upon God. And we are still thinking that we can live this life without him and somehow we depend on our religiosity, depend on the number of scriptures we memorize, depend on that I know God. And I, no, 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 no. I can't do nothing without him. I don't want to do nothing without him. I, listen, there's some things that happen in your life I really don't want to happen. The Bible says if need be, some of these things got to happen. And, and, and I ask the Lord, show me any area of my life where I have declared independence from you. The attitude towards God when, when it comes to understanding grace, here's our attitude. It should be complete dependence upon God. Here's the attitude of the New Testament saint. Complete dependence upon God. The whole battle now is declaration of independence from God, which is what he did in the Garden of Eden, right? In the Garden of Eden, he declared independence from God, fell to the garden, started working on Adam and Eve. Uh, you, 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 uh, you, don't, you don't need God. Go ahead, you, 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 you can do this, you can do that. Go ahead and eat of that fruit. And when they did that, they declared their independence from God. Satan says, look how easy that was. I'm going to get the entire planet. I'm going to convince them they don't need God. And there are a lot of people in the world today, famous and rich, they think they don't think they need God. They're miserable because they think they have the tools to be like God without God. And this year, there's going to be a burning away of self so that you can declare your total dependence on God. How simple is that? And yet it's the challenge. Complete dependence upon God is the objective of trials and sufferings. So how does God plan on perfecting and purifying this dependence on him? How do you perfect and, 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 and clarify that? I, I, I learned that lesson uh, in, in the year 24 when I got sick and, 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 and thought, that's it, I'm, I'm going to die. I still hadn't gotten all our wor the words to articulate to you, but I'm thinking, I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to die. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy. And I realized something happened. I, something got burned away. I, I realized the only person that can get me out of this is the one I can't see with my physical eyes. I, I, I totally depend on him. I, I totally depend on him. I depend on him. I get up in the morning, depend on him, show me what to put on today. I 
don't want to be doing nothing. I don't want to be caught in any area of my life where I've declared independence from God and somehow I think something that I've obtained from him or by him causes me to say, I don't need you no more. In that whenever you find yourself getting up in the mornings and you look at your days and you become less and less vocal about God blessing something about your day, watch out. Because I need, I need God to bless every walk I take. I need God to bless everywhere I go. I, I need God to bless me when I'm in my car. So you ought to be talking to God about depending on him to help you today, to take care of you today, to bless you today. And when you get to the point where that's no longer important and that's no longer being vocalized, then somehow, some way, maybe you're not aware of it, but somehow, internally, you have declared independence from needing God. I believe that this, this provision is found in suffering, this, this, this complete dependence upon God. I, I believe that, I, th I believe it's found in suffering. I, I, this might be the greatest explanation for sufferings by God's people. Why did God let that happen? Why did God let this happen? How come I found myself here? I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. I've tried and I've tried. I prayed all night long. I prayed and I prayed until I found the Lord. Well, the Lord wasn't lost. You, 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 that was a lot of effort you lost. Huh? I tried all night long. I prayed all night long. I fasted for, for, for 30, 30 days. I, I did all I know to do. Watch this. I did all I know to do and still ain't nothing happened. I'm just going to believe God. You finally reached the right place. What if you would have started off there? What if you started off in that place? I don't know what it is about us. We're saved for like, you know, we just, we just came out the baptism of food. We ain't even dry yet. And think that we can do things without God. And the church became this gigantic institution of a bunch of arrogant Christians thinking that their Bible knowledge substituted for being dependent on God. I don't care how much you know, when it's time to move, you need him to move ahead of you. You need him to walk with you. You need him to walk behind you. You need him to cover you. You need him to have your front part and your back part. Since when did you think you could live your life without God? I got to have him. I got to have him. There's a lot of things that I can do without, but I cannot live this life without him. And it's not about how much I know. It's not about, you know, how big the church is. It's not about nothing, none of that stuff. It's not about who I know. It's not about none of that. None of your fame. It ain't nothing about none, 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 none of that. I need him. I need him. I need him when I get in my bed at night. Help me go to sleep, Lord. Help me to sleep deep. I'm talking to him about my sleep every night. He's like my new melatonin. You understand? I got to have him. And then I need him to wake me up on time. Hey, glory to God. And I need him to speak to me and help me to, to stay away from myself. Because every day there's this temptation to want to turn everything towards yourself. Deliver me from myself. I need you, God. I'm getting ready to drive. I don't know what kind of crazy on the highway. Lord, help me, protect me. I need you to bless my drive in today. Glory be to God. And Lord, when I get to the office and I, and I meet with my staff, Lord, help me. I don't know. I don't want to go by what I did before and what I thought I knew. Show us something. Let us see something we've never seen before. Hallelujah, God, I need you. And I take delight in going to you every day saying, I need you. God is not going to be impressed with you coming to him one day and saying, all right, Lord, I don't need you no more. Jesus never got to the point of saying, Lord, I don't need you no more. He said, I don't do nothing without him. I believe that this provision is found in suffering. I, 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 for, for 40 years, I remember after 15 years, I started writing a book on, on the glory of suffering. And I finished it, and I'm like, Lord, what do you think? He said, throw it away. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, 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 it's very, very good, but he said, throw it away. See, God is so good. Throw it away. That's stuff I didn't understand. I was trying to avoid suffering. I was trying to avoid 
trouble. I didn't want Christian people to think that somehow, some way, you know, all suffering, you know, was of the devil. Any of you thought that before? All suffering is of the devil. What was the scripture we were looking at this morning? It was uh, John 9, 1. Turn there. John 9 and 1. We associate tribulation, trouble, and suffering with sin. We, anytime we see something that's not healing, that's not prosperity, that's not deliverance, we say, oh my God, they sinned, and so now this is why they're going to suffer. Amen? Yeah, we do that. We look at people's lives. We, we, we check people out, and we judge people's lives based on some, you're going through something. You're suffering something. Oh, something must be wrong with your relationship with God. What if something's right with it? What if their goal being tried by fire? Y'all ain't going to like me here. I'm good, though. I'm ready to teach this thing all the way. See, there was a blessing in the pandemic for me. I had to preach a year to empty chairs. I used to be afraid of that. And then the anointing came on me with empty chairs. So if y'all got to go, I done been there. I ain't scared no more. So I can preach the gospel truth without being afraid you're going to leave. You may leave. And I'm going to still be preaching. Because I'm not preaching so I can entice you to want to be a part of the church. I ain't playing them preacher games no more. Oh, come on, and I'll, 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 I'll buy you some gas. I ain't doing none of that. You, be, you, better, you better make sure you're here because God told you to be here. Because I've never felt as bold as I feel now. Why? Because it's him I'm depending on. I depend on him to help me to say what I need to say. But I started noticing that, you know, when, 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 when things were going in people's lives, and I myself did it a couple of times. Some, some ain't right there because this happened and this happened this happened. Because I kept trying to preserve suffering as a devil thing and not maybe God uses that to perfect your faith. And that perfecting of faith I call total dependence on him. I'm not talking about perfecting your faith in faith. I'm talking about perfecting your faith by being totally dependent on him. What's got to happen in your life in order for you to totally depend on him? After being in the ministry for 40 some years, it's really tempting. Did that before, did that before, did that before. And I found that certain things had to happen in my life to Remind me, uh-uh, I don't care how many times you did it, you still got to totally depend on me. Oh, that's why I went through that. And then there's certain things got to keep on you to keep you humble. Amen. Certain stuff that just will stay there. You're like, when you going to move this? <laughs> Can I get a witness? When, <laughs> when you going to move this? God, no, when is this thing going to be gone? And God like, no. See, I blessed you so much, like I did Paul, I'm going to let that thing buffet you until you can understand that my grace is sufficient. So we got to stop doing that because we keep, we continue to want to judge people based on where they were when we last saw them. And a lot of people are not where you were. Like they, they grew some. Hell has trained them. You ain't seen them in a while, but, but they've earned a, a, a degree since the last time you saw them. A degree born in a fiery furnace. All right, watch this. And, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And, and watch this, strange question. It, it wasn't strange before, but now it is. And, this, and, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? Did this man sin? Now, how did man sin? He was born blind. So what did he do? Sin when he was in his mama's womb? Goo-goo-ga-ga cussed when he was in his mom. What did he do when he was in his 
So who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why was it? They immediately they said, he's born blind, must be sin. We gotta stop that. We look at people going through things and it never, it never, it never dawns on us. Boy, they must be getting ready to do something mighty for God. Why? Look at what they're going through. They must be getting ready to do something mighty, mighty God. We're so entangled in this world's way of how they decide to lift somebody up. Joker fed two people and they got them all over the news and give them a award for finish. For, <laughs> anyway, what? <laughs> Jesus answered, neither have had this, this man sinned nor his parents. He said, so sin is not the cause. Sin is not the reason for this guy being blind. He's suffering blindness, but it wasn't because he sinned. A lot of stuff will suffer, but it won't be because we sinned. I used to think that. When things were going bad, I'm like, oh, Lord, what have I done? Oh, and then immediately, see, the devil you use this to condemn you. If you did do something crazy and then something happened, you know, sometimes we self-inflict stuff on us, okay? But God will even use that to bring you to a point where you say you need him. Because if it was self-inflicted, self was involved, which means we got to burn this thing off. Because at the same time, you might do something stupid and the mercy of God comes in and the bad you deserve, you don't get so, how you, so you can't say it was cause of sin. All right, look what it said. Jesus answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God is trying to get his works to be manifested in your life, manifested in this earth. God wants his glory to be seen. He wants his works to be seen. And some of us are not ready yet because we have too much confidence in our self-ability. Or we have too much confidence in our religious ability. And God is like, I got to burn that off until you are completely dependent upon me so when the manifestation comes, you don't give yourself the glory. And let me make it clear, the manifestations are at hand in your life. God is getting ready to do some major things in your life, but it won't be because of you having faith in your faith. It'll be because you're living by the faith of Jesus Christ. So right now, you ought to be getting yourself ready and say, take a deep breath. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. Bring it on. Bring it on. Well, I ain't, ain't kind of like bring it on. I'm like, Lord, just deliver me from self-dependence. Deliver me from, from self-dependence. And then God will allow some stuff to happen just to keep you humble. All right, now watch this now. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. All right, so let's deal with this issue of... Well, did God make that happen? A lot of things God's not responsible for. You might be responsible for it, or the enemy might be responsible for it, but what God does is he says, I'm going to allow certain things to happen. I'm going to let certain stuff happen. You ain't listening to me. Every time something stupid happened in my life, I can back up where God spoke to me before it happened. And I act like he ain't said nothing. <laughs> yeah, but when that trial came, that butt whooping came. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, Lord, I got you. Why is it we prefer a butt whooping over a simple counseling session? I don't know. Maybe that's what we need. Yay. Read this out loud with me. Yay, and all that will live in Christ. I, 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 I will assume that you are pursuing to live godly in Christ. So you know what the religious mindset is? If you live godly in Christ, you should not suffer persecution. But is that what that said? If you live godly in Christ, you should not suffer persecution. If you live godly in Christ, you should not get sick. If you live godly in Christ, you should not 
uh, have any symptoms of the virus. If you live godly in Christ, you should not. Let me, let me back up because I know I spit when I holl. I just. <laughs> can't wait till this thing over with. I'm, I'm, I miss spitting on y'all. Some, some of y'all are praying right now, social distance, Pastor. You're getting a little bit of clothes back. Social distance. I, I kind of wish I'd have understood this before. I live godly, and he says, you will suffer persecution just because you live godly. You can suffer persecution, and you ain't did nothing to nobody. You can suffer persecution, and you make your confessions every day. Why would God do that? Well, I'll read to you in a minute. He'll say, if, if need be. But the promise is, is they that live godly. So it should not be a surprise. Suffering persecution should not be a surprise for they that live godly. Now, you may say, well, Dog, if I'm going to suffer persecution, I might as well have gone back to the clubs. If I'm going to suffer persecution, I might as well have gone hit this joint right here. If I'm going to suffer persecution, no, 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 no. This persecution is going to bring praise and glory to you. That persecution you're talking about is going to kill you. <laughs> and mess you up. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to, to walk with God. See, Jesus was Jesus, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating blood. Jesus is Jesus, and he gets beat up and mugged, and then he's nailed to a cross of Calvary. Jesus is Jesus, and you're trying to stay out of hell. He actually went to hell. You ain't going to live more godly than him. But the glory that was released. Paul said, I look forward to my tribulation because then when I'm weak, then am I strong. We got to figure this thing out. We got to quit telling these fables to make you feel good, trying to con you into being saved. You got to figure out how to get your life together because this year, you got to be careful. A friend of mine said, this is the year where God's going to solidify stuff. Don't be in the wrong place and get stuck there because you done found yourself being solidified in the wrong place. If you're going to get saved, you need to get saved rat, R-A-T, now. Quick as a rat. You need to get saved. You need to get your, you need to get your life together. You need to quit being a victim. Uh, 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 you, when you stay a victim a long time, it, it begins to shape your character. It begins to shape your identity. It starts shaping who you are. And, and you don't even know how to act because you're so used to being a victim. And you can never, when you're a victim, you create a ceiling over your head. You can't go but so far. You can never get past. If, if you're living a life of a victim uh, and you're wondering why you're not making progress, victims don't make progress. One day you're going to have to get tired of playing the victim. That happened, that happened. Don't like your mama, don't like your daddy. And you got to quit. One day you got to say, I'm so tired of this. I ain't heard nobody but myself. I need to quit playing the victim. I need to throw the victim card. Because victims, they blame everybody, but it never seems to come back to them. I don't make light of what happened. My heart goes out to you. But that's the whole deal. That's what Satan wants to do. Paralyze you into that victim mentality so he can keep you from making progress. And there's too much progress that God has planned for your life for you to still be walking around here a victim. You mad at your daddy because he cussed you out 50 years ago. I ain't planning, I'm not going to give the devil the satisfaction of me being a victim because I got cussed out real bad. Your daddy was stupid. He repented. He's a much better person now. Stop being a victim. Quit playing the blame game and come on and live your life so God can expand your horizon and do the things you need to do. You ain't hurt nobody but yourself. <laughs> come to the church playing the victim. They're them church people. Church hurt and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're still blaming somebody, you haven't changed. 
Your blame indicates you haven't accepted responsibility. So who will you blame today? Whose fault will it be today? Whose fault is it that you ain't got a job? Whose fault is it that you, you get turned down for this and turned down? Whose fault is it that everybody else getting promoted but you ain't getting promoted? Whose fault is it? And after a while, here's the sad thing about victims. After a while, people don't like hanging around victims. Some of you getting mad at me now. You don't know what I went through. Victim. <laughs> Whatever you've gone through, somebody's gone through something worse, and somebody's gone through something worse than they went through, and somebody's gone through something worse than they did. And you got to understand the whole game. Satan allowed that to happen and working in your head to keep you paralyzed. You will live your whole life stuck. Amen. Playing the victim card, keeping it close by. When you need it, plan a victim card. Like you the only one has something happen to you. Stuff done happened to everybody around here. Everybody around here done been, been uh, de deceived, they have been betrayed, they've been hurt, they've been disappointed, and even worse than that. But you have to kind of wake up one day and say, I ain't let that stop me. That ain't stopping me. You ain't stopping me. The devil ain't stopping me. God has plans for me. God has plans for my future. Those plans are good plans, and I'm not going to stop those plans because nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Then nobody call and say, Happy Merry Christmas to me. Then nobody even call and wish me a Happy New Year. Lord, I'll have to holler what I do for people. Well, maybe you need to quit doing it. If you're doing it for somebody so, so they can reciprocate it, then maybe you need to stop doing it because your life needs to be that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expect nothing thing, but I'm going to appreciate everything. And you, you expect too much stuff that you don't have a right to respect. If you're always expecting something, then you need to just don't do it. Well, I ain't never going to call them because they didn't call you and wish you a, a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Christmas? Really? Well, I can't keep a job because it's my daddy's fault. Lord, I almost said something. It started with an end. But I'm delivered. God helping me. I'm being delivered. And you know, we can all do the same thing. Everybody here can do that. I can go back and look at my daddy. My daddy, he did, my daddy worked three jobs. My daddy wasn't ever home. But I thought, that's cool. We got something to eat. I honor him for working his butt off. Now, he had some extracurricular activity, but I still honor him for working his butt off. I got <laughs> I to I let all that go. I'm so glad that I wasn't still a victim when he died. I'm so glad that I put my card away. Last act of my relationship with my dad can be summed up in three days. First day, kissed him on the cheek. Told him I love him. Second day, prayed the prayer of salvation, made sure he was saved. The third day, he had went home to be with the Lord because I put away my blame card. <laughs> or I'd have lived all my life in regret, and regret is an ugly monster. I'm talking to somebody. You know, I left completely, left my subject. Went over here to a new sermon called Understanding How You Need to Get Rid of the Victim Card. Because that's the Holy Ghost. He's trying to get some of y'all ready. But some of that suffering coming because you keep, you keep holding on to the root of some of that suffering. He said, God, dog, I wanted to take you through. Your selfishness is not dying, is it? Because you won't let go of your victim card. You 75 years old and still talking about you being a victim of a bad divorce, like you're the only woman in the entire world that has gone through a divorce. And you were so busy being a victim about your divorce, you had an awesome man, he been trying to get your attention for 20. <laughs> he just got tired. Every time y'all go out for coffee, you talking about you don't understand what I've gone through. He's like, man, I can't deal with all this. I got to go. Don't know, I'm about to become a victim of this relationship. I ain't doing that.
Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10 says, and you see it again, I didn't think you could, persecution and blessings, I just thought I'd never see them in the same sentence. He says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. I'm like, what? So when people slander me, dog me out, make fun of me and stuff, I, I, you, the blessings associated with the persecution? Now I know what Paul was talking about, that glory and persecution. For there is the kingdom, for there is, is the, therein is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you or, or, and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then he says, why are they doing that? Watch this. Rejoice? No, I don't feel like, I don't feel like doing no church stuff right now. I want to cut and cuss and get back. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. They persecuted the prophets. In other words, notice again, you're not the only one that's going to be going through this. But wait, what makes it tolerable? Why, why, how can I do this? It, it's because I know that he's perfecting me. He's maturing me. And he's using these things of the world to help grow me up. Look at Luke twenty two forty two 42 in the NLT. Luke, Luke twenty two forty two 42 in the NLT. Oh, my goodness. What a year, what a year. Ooh, man, I'm going to do some farming this year. I'm going to plant so much word on the inside of you. This word going to come out of you, and that devil ain't going to know what to do. This word is coming out of you. You're going to say, you, in other words, you're going to show up to the devil. You're going to show up to the devil. You're going to do like Bernie, Bernie Mac used to do. I ain't scared of you. <laughs> you're going to let him know I ain't scared of you? Look at Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me, if you're willing. And then he had a thought. He caught that thought. He had a flesh moment there. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So you see that through intense suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' unfailing dependence on the Father was expressed in these words, not my will, but thine be done. His dependence, his dependence on the Father Lord, I am not enjoying what I am going through, but I depend on you. I, I, not my will, but thy will be done. I'm depending on you. You got me. And there may, may be times in your life where you're going through things, and they, are, they may be painful, but you've got to express your dependence upon him. Not my will, yours be done. There's certain things I had to settle and say, I don't know why this is happening but not my will, yours be done, I depend on you. I not only just have confidence in your power to bring your promises to pass, but I have confidence in your wisdom to know what I need to go through to mature me so I can prepare myself for what I got to go through. Jesus, the Father told him, he said, you got to go to hell, bro. We got to get you ready for that. Being beat up. He was beat up so bad, he was not recognizable. So you have this little cute little, you know, crucifixion scene where Jesus is with this, you know, stylish white outfit. If you understood how Jesus was on the cross, it would be rated X if we did it in church. It wasn't like that. He was so beat up, you couldn't even hardly recognize him. You got to understand, you're, 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 you're being beat in the face, so you're swollen. You're bloody. You're black and blue and... <laughs> I think the part that gets me is when he fell down and they thought he can't take no more. He forced himself to stand up again. I was like, what? 
would cause you to continue in this because he had to take it all because he knew one day you were going to be born. And he couldn't leave none of it out. He got to take every bit of it because he carried your pain. He bore your weaknesses. And if that wasn't enough, they threw a cross on him, marched him, Then they took him and laid him on the cross and took about eight-inch spikes, not little tacks, eight-inch spikes. Nailed it through his flesh to the point where Thomas was doubting him and Jesus showed him the holes in his hands and his side. And he said, handle me for a spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. They nailed him to the cross. And on that cross, every sin and every pain and every weakness, he carried it. Everything you deserved, he took it all. Depending on God, There's some things I have come to the point after over 40 years of ministry, I, I can look back and say, oh, I see why that had to happen. As much as I regretted it, I see why that had to happen. As painful as that was, I see why that had to happen. A lot of things that didn't, if they didn't happen, I wouldn't be prepared for this. And I realized that God doesn't mature us in a straight, skinny line. I see that God matures us in a wide line, and we start over here, and then he may have to take us over here to this corner, and then we go over there in that corner, we, and then we have to go over here in this corner. We're still making progress, but we're visiting areas of preparation and testings, so it helps us in the progress that we're making in our lives. I, I don't complain about those things anymore. I take a note out of his notebook and says, Lord, not my will. I don't understand why this is happening. It hurts so much. But let your will be done. I depend on you, Lord. I depend on you. Give me wisdom. Show me what to do. And Jesus on that cross demonstrated so much. I don't want to be the church Christian that knows the Greek and the Hebrew, that memorizes the scripture every day and can, you know, on command demonstrate to you how many scriptures I know. Nah. I want to know him. And I want to depend on him to take care of me and my family. I depend on him to take care of you. I depend on him from the time you leave your house until the time you come here that God's watching over you, he's taking care of you, that no virus will touch you, that will not be destroyed instantly. I depend on him for you. So, as easy as it is to die, it's easy. I realized there was so much undone. It's not now. A message that has been simplified to the very bottom line. Independence from God or dependence, a complete dependence upon him. I need him. I need him. I need him. I need him. 
Oh, I need him every hour. I need him. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to, to thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to We're never going to be the same again. And while in the world it will get darker and darker, in the church it'll get lighter and lighter. And the words that he prophesied over us shall surely come to pass. You are the light of the world, a city that cannot be hid. So now it's time to put your stuff away and live by the faith of Jesus and declare what he declared, not my will, let thy will be done. And whatever I need to go through, whatever fiery furnace I need to go through, whatever lion's den I need to go through, if it is to prepare me and to prepare and perfect me and, and to put me where I can now see the glory and give praise for what I will see, I then am like Paul. When I am weak, then am I strong. These blessings will come upon you in such a way that you won't even have enough room to receive it all, and you're going to take what's running out of the cup and find somebody else who needs some and share it with them. This is going to be that kind of year. You're not going to be able to get this kind of message by looking at the worldly TV, because God is going to make all of them look kind of bad. The experts with their, 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 their logarithms and all that, all that stuff is going to come to naught. Watch. They're going to be telling you what's going to happen, and, and, when, and, and, and God's going to do a switch over real quick, and they're going to be like, what happened? What happened? You didn't factor in God. You forgot about the God factor. God can lift a man up and bring a man down. God going to put into office those that he wants in the office, and he's going to snatch out of office those that he don't want in office. And before you look around, oh, look at what the Lord has done. And you're going to look at your life, and you say, oh, now I see why I had to go through that. I'm ready made. I'm ready made. I'm ready made. I'm a God-made man, not a self-made man. I don't want to be a self-made man. I want to be a God-made man. You can have confidence in your education all day long. I ain't got nothing against education unless you try to exalt it above the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom we get from God and the education you got from the, from the university, God will make you look like an illiterate. <laughs> it's time, world changes. It's time. Get your house in order. How? In this house, we depend on God. Lift your hands up right now. Let's worship him. I'm out of time. Father, we do praise you.
We thank you. Thank you for the world changers. Thank you for what you're about to do in them, with them, through them. Lord, I depend on you to help me to serve them, to serve them as they serve you with the might and the power and the wisdom and the anointing that you will put upon them. Use them in a mighty way. We're ready, Lord. We're not afraid. We are not afraid. You got our backs. A thousand will fall at our side, 10,000 at our right hand, but we're not afraid. It shall not come near us. Our children are protected. We are protected. We abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And all is well with us. So with great confidence in you, we move. In you, we breathe. In you, we have our very being. We bless you, Lord. None of us, all of you, we declare our dependence towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you receive that this morning? Come on, open your mouth while you're seated. Give the Lord a shout of praise. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Come on, let's. Let's, let's give our offering this morning. Let's worship God with our giving this morning. Somebody said, what? We went from that to giving? Yeah, you got to understand. You got to understand, man. This is what provokes me to give. You know, part of, my, part of me understanding that I, I'm dependent on God, so I'm, I'm not afraid of giving. I'm not afraid of giving any amounts, whatever, because I depend on Him. My giving is a celebration of my dependence upon him. There's somewhere in your life where you can look back and see that God did something you didn't deserve, but he did it anyway. Y'all pray for Taffy now. We are going to dig into this word and dig in it and dig in it and then God has to help us to break it down. God's got to help us to articulate it properly. God's got to help us to get your ears anointed to hear it. But this time next year, ain't no way in the world you're going to be the same. You will be in full operation of the call that God has put on your life. You will know what God has called you to do. People belittle believing so much like it's just nothing. It's the biggest thing ever. So we're worshiping God with our gifts. We're worshiping God with our offerings. We're worshiping God with our seed. If you need an offering envelope, uh, 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 you raise your hands, the ushers will put, put one in your hands. This is our worship, man. And every time I think about dependence upon God, I think about I, and there's no better way to depend on God than to worship Him with my gifts. I used to give thinking I'm going to run out of it. I depend on him. I depend on him for everything. Oh, my God. Man, I wish you understood what God has done for me. I'm going to get articulation, Will, because, boy, I tell you, I, he's real. And he wants to do some amazing things for you if you will let him. If you're streaming into this message today, the ways to give, they're on the screen. You can text world change this space and the amount to 74483, or you can call that number. You can mail on that address, or you can go to the websites, worldchanges.org, greflodonaministries.org. There's a, also a QR code for your stream. You can tap into that. Those of you who are here, you can give by using the envelope or Hit the QR code both here in the dome or as you exit on those two columns where you see those television, they have it there as well. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give and to sow. And we worship you with these gifts. We worship you in the beauty of your holiness for everything you've done. 
for every time you delivered us, for every time you solidified something in our lives that you'd called us to walk in or to have or the gifts that you've given to us, we say thank you. And with a great heart of praise, we give this gift to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you can go ahead and receive this offering and uh, you can hit the code with your phones or those of you who are streaming, you can go ahead and get all that done right now. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to have an altar call this morning. You notice I don't have them every time, but I'm going to have an altar call this morning. Uh, and you can respond accordingly. Um, man, I'll be able to articulate this thing that I see, but this is going to be a very, very um, needful message that you, I mean, you're going to need it. You're going to have to retrain your thinking now. You got you to gotta retrain your thinking. You got you to gotta say it, and then you got to rehearse it. You got to retrain your thinking. If you're here and you've never been born again, I'd like to lead you in, in, this, in this opportunity to get saved. If you're watching on the stream and you've never been saved, I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. If you'll just say these words after me, then after we finish praying and declaring these words, you will be saved. If that's you, let's pray. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father. I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now, I repent of all my sins. I receive the free gift of forgiveness. Lord, I need a Savior. Be my Lord and my Savior. I receive you now. I believe you now. And I declare by faith that I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Now, if you just prayed that simple prayer, you're born again, and I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Amen. Welcome you to the kingdom of God. If you prayed that prayer with me online, just text the keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Provide your name and email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. If you prayed that prayer here in the dome, if you'll get your Bibles and personal belongings and come on down front, we want to believe with you. Now, if you're here and you're not a member of the church and you'd like to become a member of World Changers Church International here in College Park, uh, you can do so if you'll come on down if you want to join the church today. And uh, so those are just the two things right there, born again and to join the church, you can do that today. Those of you who are online and uh, you want to join our, our, our online membership, you can do that as well. All that information is there for you. Uh, go to the worldchangers.org and click join at the top of the page. Uh, you want to be a member of the eChurch, you can do that. Or you can text join WCCI, all one word, to 51555, and we will send you all of the benefits of e-membership. God bless you and welcome to World Changers eChurch membership. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. We welcome all of you who are coming down this morning. Yeah, get this new year started off right. Amen. Praise the Lord. At this time, those of you who have come, if you'll follow these gentlemen here to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you and give you biblical understanding of how to obtain and how to maintain what you came to receive. And we thank God that you will never be the same again. Congregation, if you'll please stand for our final blessing. Happy New Year's to everybody. God bless you. It's going to be a phenomenal year, supernatural year, <laughs> a year of blessings that are going to come upon your life because we understand our God. Amen. Lift your hands up. And now unto him who's able to do exceedingly great things in your life, may his blessings be upon you. May his protection be over you. I declare that you walk in divine protection, that a thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hands, but it shall not come near you. I declare that God is perfecting everything that concerns you. And I thank God that all is well with you and your house. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God. 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. Happy New Year, and God bless you.